War in the land of Israel has shaken the Mideast and rattled the whole world. Some people say that this could be the very beginnings of World War III and everyone is watching what's happening now. What does the Bible say about Israel and that land? The answer is in the book of Genesis. Let's talk about this. The conflict that has set the world on fire these days is not about land, actually. It's about a burning hatred for a people group that someone thinks just doesn't even deserve to live. Genesis 15 is where we find what God has to say about the Mideast and that land of Canaan. But Genesis 15 is about far more than land, dirt rivers. God has some things to say, and he speaks very directly to Abram, who will become Abraham in Genesis 15. Let's go there. Abram had been promised by God a son. He's the promised one. And years have gone by now, 15 years later, Abram has a hang up with God. He tells God about it in Genesis 15 in verse 2. Here we go. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So Abram's hang up, goes right to God. Friend, I hope that you and God have that kind of relationship together that when you have a hang-up, rather than seethe about it or quietly walk away from God, that you go ahead and just out with it because God is not afraid of your hang-ups. He's not afraid of our questions either. And so Abram, knowing what he knows so far about God, is free to go and tell God about his hang-up. So he essentially says, well, Lord, you haven't kept your promise. You said I would have a son, and, well, I don't have one now, and I have this one, Eliezer, but he's not of my blood. And so let's review this. There are three young men in the story so far. One is Ishmael. He is not the chosen one. He's not the promised one. He came to Abram through a handmaid of his wife, and he's now gone away. Isaac is yet to come, but Abram has a hang up with God because Isaac isn't living in his home yet, hasn't been born. Who is this Eliezer? Well, he is a steward in the house of Abraham. We believe greatly trusted by Abraham, maybe the one who later would go and search for a wife for that promised son, Isaac. But Eliezer is not the fulfillment of God's promise. And Abram has a hang up that if he were to die now, all his belongings would go to one, not the promised son. Well, God is going to speak very directly to the answer about Abraham's hang-up, and God here in Genesis 15 speaks very directly about who is the owner of Canaan. And God is going to tell us far more than that as we journey through these great verses in this great chapter of the opening book of the Bible. Verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So if anyone had a question about who is Abraham's true son who met the promise of God, that's going to be Isaac, the true heir, who is going to come from Abraham's bowels when the man is 100 years old. Abraham was biologically dead in his ability to have a son. His wife is 90 years old, but that little baby boy comes by the promise of God. But God now is going to remind him of the promise he already made. It seems as though God is not set upset. God is not upset with Abram 
over the fact that he shared his hangup with God. He just gives him a very clean reminder of God's promise. Verse 5, he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. In other words, not just one son, Abraham. <laughs> I'm going to fill the land with your children. Your descendants will be too many to number. And now Abram's redemption in Genesis 15, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. So there is where the Bible lets us know that Abraham has now become a saved man. How? By faith in the plan and promise of God. Now, Abraham was different than a person today. We have the details of how God would bring about redemption's plan that included his son, Jesus Christ. But Abraham had the beginnings of the truth. He had God's word. Abraham looked forward where there were no details about a cross, but he looked forward that the plan of God would work to bring about full redemption to all whose faith is in him. And Abraham has shown that faith now, Genesis 15, 6, and now God introduces him to the idea that, well, there's going to be a land. He later will, will say, wherever your foot tread goes will be your inheritance. So what about this land then? Well, it's clear and very plainly taught in the Bible that land belongs to Abraham's people. This is the land of Israel. It belongs to the children of Abraham. And he said, verse 8, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Here comes God's assurance of his fulfillment of this promise about the land. Verse 9, he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, Abraham is from Ur of the Chaldees, that is the Chaldean mountains. This is the home of the world's first dynasty, the first ruling empire of the world. This is the Chaldeans, also known as the Babylonians. Well, that's where Abram came from. And now out on that wilderness, desert floor, he looks into the skies and, and his faith is in the Lord and he is saved and promised that land to be his. And now God, in order to again give sweet assurance that the promise of God will be kept, he goes to an ancient Chaldean ritual. Now here's what would happen. When two men were going to make a deal, they would split an animal. The animal would be killed. He would be cut down the middle, right down the spine, and half the animal would be laid on the right side, half on the left side. And those two men would walk in between those carcass halves of an animal. The idea here is those men would now in some way shake hands, agree together over the terms of the deal. And they're saying, if I don't meet my side of this bargain, let it be done to me what has been done to the animal. But God now is going to go back to that Chaldean ritual that Abram would be all too familiar with, but God does five times more. There are five animals here. One, a heifer. Two, a she-goat. Three, a ram goat. Four would be a dove, and five would be a pigeon. Five animals Abraham was to divide asunder and lay them on the right and the left. After doing that, Abraham, verse number 11, is kept busy in the afternoon hours. Here we go, verse 11. When the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So I want you to get an idea of how much work this would be. Have you ever, have you ever skinned an animal? You ever skinned a heifer or a goat? 
You ever done any butcher work? Well, this would take some time. That would take some effort. And now the buzzards come and they circle and they're after dead meat. And Abraham spends his afternoon driving them away. And skip, skip all the way to verse number 17. Here's the finish of this. God has now put Abram to sleep. As the sun is going down, the day is far spent. Abraham finds himself unable to stay awake. Verse number 17, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. From the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. We'll stop right there. Isn't this interesting? Can you see those animals? Why those animals? Well, they were the livestock, all three years old. The heifer, she-goat, ram-goat, those are all animals of sacrifice. And then there are two birds, a dove and a pigeon. One of them sort of a regal bird, later represented of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, present at the baptism of Jesus. And then there's a pigeon. That speaks about common man. You ever heard the phrase, oh, he's a pigeon? It's not a complimentary term, is it? So the pigeon represents, I think, probably common man. There's something here for everyone. God goes to great detail here in the preparation of this old Chaldean ritual, and Abraham knew exactly what was going on, except there's a shocking end to the story. God put Abraham to sleep. He wasn't able to go among those halves of those animals, and he just slept through it. But he's able enough that there is a lamp, a burning furnace out there where Abraham is supposed to be. God is sealing the deal all by himself. And my friend, when God seals a promise all by himself, you write this down, God's going to keep that promise. Nothing is going to happen to the events described by God. In fact, a moment ago when I said skip, skip, we went through about six Bible verses without any comment at all, but God gave Abram a spotless passage of prophecy about what is going to happen to the inhabitants of that land promised to the children of Abraham. Friend, you can read your history book and find it has happened in the world just as God said it would before God in the burning lamp, a smoking furnace went out and sealed the deal with Abraham. Amen. Friend, God is going to keep that promise, though the buzzards circle around. I tell people all the time, where the light is shining, expect bugs. And where God is doing a work, expect the buzzards to arise. But friend, God is going to keep those promises he has until this day and he will in the future. Now there's more here. In these sacrificial animals is a picture of Jesus Christ who will be the Lamb of God. John the Baptist is going to come along later and one day look up and see Jesus as he passes by. And John will make an announcement never heard before, John 1, 29, in the ears of man. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And there was Jesus a few days later up on that cross, that horrid cross, the death of a horrible crucifixion where the Son of God sealed the deal for our salvation when He by Himself with His hands nailed down single-handedly took care of the sacrificial payment of our sin that we could be saved as Abram by faith in Jesus alone.